45 years ago, I married the love of my life. And we had um, three wonderful children. We have uh, eight grandchildren together. Shortly after uh, my husband retired, he texted me that he wanted a divorce. Two and a half months after filing, it was done. And within the year, he was remarried. All of this was a shock. It was completely unexpected. I thought I thought our marriage was happy. Um, we had been in church together for years. We had led Bible study in our own home for 30 years. The thought never crossed my mind that we wouldn't cross the finish line together. When I was in, in the midst of really this dark place, a sweet friend of mine, she sent me this passage that I never noticed before. It's from Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 54, and it's specifically verses five and six. It says, for your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name and the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. The Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. Is that awesome or what? <laughs> it just, it says it all. And I think I had never seen that in the Bible before. And yet God has so many purposes for what he does beyond what I could comprehend. But I know that one little teeny one was because he knew that someday I would be reading that verse and it would comfort me and other women would be reading that verse and it would comfort them. I think a lot of us wonder if I, if I experience some of what I know goes on around the world and even people that I know have experienced um, with tragedy in their lives, would I be faithful? Um, is, my, is my faith that real? And what I discovered through the process is that it's not about my faith. It's about Jesus because he is called faithful and true. And I have so many times shared with other people that he, he will never leave you and forsake you. But when it was me, um, it, I realized how very personal and true that is. One of the things that happens in divorce is that you can be lured into believing that you are who your ex says you are. And I know that I'm not who my ex says I am. I know that I'm not even who I think I am. I know that I am who God says I am. And God has plans and purposes for my life that have not changed since before the divorce. Even though my circumstances are different, who I am in Christ is the same as it always was. I want to say thank you to my church family because they walked alongside me so well and continue to do that. Um, but as I was too weak to stand on my own, they, they carried me. And I'm so grateful for divorce care. If, if anyone is not aware of it, it is the most wonderful place to go. The, the church offers it, and, um, and it's, a, it's a place where you can go, be filled with truth, but also um, be in a room full of other people who, um, who are not overwhelmed by your grief, who are not overwhelmed by your tears because they're also experiencing the same thing. Most of all, I'm thankful to Jesus because he is, he is my way when I can't seem to find the way. He is the truth when nothing makes sense around me. And he is my life when I need fresh vision and fresh purpose. He's the way, the truth, and the life. I love 
Kelly Kendrick, she is a stud at. She is one of my heroes. Um, statistically, divorce has affected half the room here today, whether directly or indirectly. And I want you to know if you are going through a divorce, have been through a divorce, that does not make you a half person. It doesn't make you less than a whole person. But it does give you a story to tell. And here's what I want you to understand. When someone has betrayed you or hurt you, as a Jesus following person, you still have to forgive. Forgiveness frees you. Bitterness enslaves you. And when you're bitter towards someone, it doesn't hurt the person you're bitter toward, it just hurts you. And I'm not saying it's easy to forgive, I'm not. It's very difficult at times. But when you understand how God has forgiven you, it's easier to forgive someone else who's hurt you. Doesn't mean you have to like it. Doesn't mean you have to hang out with them all the time. It just means you've given it back to God. And it frees you to live the life that God's called you to live. I'll tell you another thing. If you have been through a, a painful betrayal, rejection, maybe marriage, may not be marriage, you have a story to tell and you need to tell your story. It may not be on a video on Sunday morning, but someone needs the encouragement of your story because you're never the only person going through what you're going through and there's always someone else that needs to be encouraged. It's one thing to say, I, I'm so sorry. It's another thing to say, I know exactly how you feel. And there'll be a day you'll wake up and your heart won't hurt as much and you just hang in there because I've been through it. So use your story for God's glory, amen? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John 18. We're gonna talk about the ultimate betrayal today the ultimate rejection, and how someone handled it divinely. And it's gonna give us an example of everything I just talked about, everything Kelly just talked about. It gives us a biblical example for walking through pain and hurt. John 18. We're gonna go through the first 18 verses today. Isaiah prophesied the text that we're gonna be looking at the next several weeks 700 years earlier before it happened. Chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 13 through 17, we spent weeks and weeks in. It's called the Upper Room Discourse. And Jesus is training his men, I'm about to die and go away, and you're on, and there's no plan B. And these guys are not understanding the plan. These guys are not getting it. He's gonna be betrayed by one of his own. He's gonna be illegally arrested He's gonna have three trials, all of which were illegal. He is going to be found innocent each time he's on trial. And he's gonna be brutally tortured and killed. He's gonna be nailed to a tree and thrown into a hole in the ground. And the people who did it will go, that's that. The next several weeks, we're gonna be talking about the passion of Jesus. Passion is an old word that literally means sufferings, the sufferings of Christ. And the worst evil in the end you're gonna see has brought about the greatest love and mercy and grace you'll ever encounter. And it's true not just for what Jesus went through, it's true for what you're going through. If you will trust God through what you're going through, it may be days, it may be weeks, it may be months, maybe the rest of your life, he will bring something beautiful through such ugliness. But you're gonna have to cling to him. Well, this sounds really sad day, doesn't it? I got some good news for you though. I read the end of the book, we win. <laughs> I like being with undefeated ones. Like, that's why I went to Clemson, right? Undefeated. <laughs> Too soon? <laughs> Chapter 18, verse one and two. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas who betrayed him, also knew the place. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. I wanna kinda of set the picture of what's going on. So he's had the upper room discourse, he's told his guys he's about to leave. They now leave Jerusalem, they go over a place called the Kidron Valley, they go up a ridge, they go into a garden, and it's called the Garden of Gethsemane. Now when you and I think about gardens, we tend to think of like vines and flowers and pretty and grass, and. This was an industrial workplace. 
The Garden of Gethsemane was where they used to take olives and they would press them. They would take two great stones and press them and they would use the olive oil. First and foremost, they would use it in the temple worship. They would use it to anoint the high priest. They would also use it secondarily for food. They would use it for soap. They would use it for light. So really this olive oil gave them how to see, how to worship, and it nourished them. And so this was the Garden of Gethsemane, a place of great pressing, a, a place that the affliction comes for the blessing to happen. And just like you're going through trials, you've got your own Garden of Gethsemane, there's gonna be a pressing in your life at some point. There's certain texts in the Bible, like I'm sure that wasn't the first time Kelly read that part of Isaiah, it's just the first time it meant something to her. There's texts you'll hear me preach where it'll apply to you like someone hits you with a, a hammer as we talk about it. I don't have to apply that for you. Your heart automatically applies it. There'll be some Sundays you're like, uh, really didn't hit me that much. Make a mental note because that text will hit you at some other point when you're going through something else that applies. I think this text today is gonna hit all of us because all of us at some point have gone through hard times or will go through hard times and we need to make note of this text. So in the Old Testament, a thousand years before this happened, there was another king that got rejected in Jerusalem and Jerusalem went after his false son, Absalom, and King David left Jerusalem. He went through the Kidron Valley. He went up the same cliff into the same garden. He looked back over Jerusalem like Jesus is gonna do, and he wept for the people of Jerusalem. A thousand years ago, it happened on the same hill. Jerusalem, if you look at it from the south entrance, two sides of the city, it has two hillsides on each side, and on the hillsides it has a valley on each side. On one hillside of Jerusalem is called Hinnom, and that Hinnom hill is a place where you would literally go and burn your trash. It is a trash heap, it is known as a place of death, it's known as a place of destruction, nothing good, nothing alive. Matter of fact, that word is used in your Old Testament to equate with Hades, or we would say in the New Testament, the place of hell, the place of burning, if you will. On the other side of Jerusalem, where the temple sits on the south corner, there's a, a, a valley called the Kidron Valley. There's water that runs through that valley, and in that valley is a place of life. So literally, when any person came up to the city of Jerusalem, it literally, Jerusalem sat like a triangle in the road, and you had either death or life, and you make a choice and a reminder every time you come up to the city of Jerusalem. Jesus had just crossed this Kidron Valley with his men. This was the time of Passover. So Passover, they would have just have slaughtered in the homes 200,000 lambs. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. The 200,000 lambs that are slaughtered at Passover. There's kids in these homes. What do kids do with a lamb that they have for a few days? They name it. Fluffy, whitey, softy. They have fallen in love with these lambs. And then dad takes this now house pet, picks it up on the day of Passover, and says this day is more special, it's different from every other day of the year. And he teaches his children about Passover. Passover is when our Lord took us out of slavery in Egypt, took us through the wilderness, and brought us into the promised land. We celebrate the fact that this lamb was sacrificed so that we get to live because we are God's chosen people. Now, the amazing picture is this. Jesus just crossed the Kidron Valley. He just crossed this stream of water that runs through there. This stream was connected through drains back to the temple. So on Passover and other festivals, this stream literally ran red in water from the blood of the sacrifices. The Lamb of God, John the Baptist at the first part of John says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the earth. Now the Lamb of God is walking across this red stream that's filled with blood of sacrifice with his men going up to the place of crushing where he will give his life as a ransom for all. Verse three. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. When I say lanterns and torches and weapons, anything come to mind? I think of the old Frankenstein movies, don't you? Lanterns, torches, and weapons. Like there's a mob, and they've kind of revved everything up, and they're going to get the monster. Jesus is their Frankenstein. Frankly, let's put it this way. 
Jesus being alive was bad for business for the Jewish religious leaders. If he keeps cleaning out the temples, they take, he's taking away all the income, all the money they're making hand over fist, and they're gonna have to go get him at night. And another gospel writer tells us, whenever you've seen this scene in movies or you've seen it um, on TV, it's usually Judas and a few Pharisees and a few officials. Another gospel writer says that there was a Roman cohort, which is a battalion, which is 600 Roman soldiers armored and ready for battle. So Judas with 600 armed soldiers and a few Pharisees and officials have come up to the Garden of Gethsemane, the place of pressing to take Jesus and to arrest him. Now why would you have to have 600 officers to come get Jesus? One man. Well you gotta understand at this time Jesus had gained great popularity among the people. So we've gotta do it at night because where are all the people on Passover night? They're in their homes, the doors are closed, the windows are pulled down, they're celebrating Passover. So we're gonna go get this guy at night, which by the way was illegal, you can't be arrested at night, and we're gonna go get him, and we're gonna take him in, and we're gonna try him at night, which was illegal, and someone that would be tried for a capital crime had to be tried on two separate days. There had to be a day in between the days. So what these men are brilliantly gonna do is they're gonna go and they're gonna try him first and then they're gonna beat him all night long and then at 6 a.m. when the sun rises, which for a Jewish mind and understanding was the next day, the Sanhedrin would say right after 6 a.m. that he's also guilty because for a capital crime you had to be guilty in two different courts of law. Everything they're doing in this trial is illegal and the problem is they didn't know their Bibles. These Pharisees and religious leaders taught that when the Messiah comes, he will conquer Rome, he will reign and conquer all enemies, and we will reign with him forever, and he can never be killed. They did not know their Bibles. What I said two weeks ago that Hosea says, without the understanding of truth, there is destruction. A lack of knowledge brings destruction. And so now these guys are going to arrest the Messiah, and they're gonna kill him. They're gonna give him a trial, it's like saying, we're gonna give you a trial and then we're gonna crucify you. And everything they're gonna do is illegal. We're gonna see this illegalities all through the next several weeks, but this is just setting the tone for how they do it. In order to get him at night, they had to get a guy on the inside. His name is Judas. Judas, I never heard a guy go, you know I relate most to Judas and the disciples. And people say, oh, I'm Peter, mouth insert foot, right? I'm John, I'm the one that Jesus loves, you know. I'm Andrew, I'm always bringing people to Jesus. I'm always a connection, I'm a catalyzer. I've never heard someone say, me and Judas, totally relate to that guy. Judas was the money keeper. Now Judas was a guy, if you saw him on the outside, would think that is a sharp guy. Matter of fact, when Jesus held out the bread and said, there is one of you that's gonna betray me, and he offers Judas the bread, which is another chance to repent. Judas leads when? At night, because all bad things happen at night. Your mama said nothing good happens after midnight. She was right. <laughs> Judas goes out in the night because Judas had bought into what the Pharisees had taught him his whole life, that when the Messiah comes, we'll get fame, we'll get wealth, and we'll get to conquer, and that's the kind of Jesus I want. And then when Jesus starts talking about crosses and dying and being atonement and a sacrifice, Judas goes, I'm out. Is it possible that people may follow Jesus today, come to church today, not because they really wanna follow Jesus, but they like the perks of Jesus? Is it true that a businessman or businesswoman can come to church just to hand out business cards and make business connections and it has nothing to do with submitting their lives to Christ? You bet. Is it possible that pastors can lead churches? Women and men can stand on stages and preach and it's really about a financial opportunity or a popularity opportunity. I gotta tell you, if you wanna be popular, don't be a preacher. That's not the route I would take, right? <laughs> I saw a friend, I hadn't seen him in years and he didn't know I was a pastor and he said, what are you doing? I said, well, this is always interesting. I'm a pastor. He goes, really? You got a private jet? <laughs> and he was kidding, but it was kinda. It's like, nope, I don't have a private jet, not that kind of pastor. But Jesus, the one that has never hurt anyone, the one that has only been kind, the one that has only been loving, 
is about to get arrested and beaten and tortured and nailed to a tree because men will love Eastern mysticism and they will love spirituality and they will love religion and they'll love doing good things for people that makes their hearts feel good. But when you start talking about the great I am, when you start talking about the way, the truth, the life, nobody comes to the Father but by me, when you start talking about Jesus is the door to heaven and all must pass through him and there's no other way and all paths do not leave the same place, the things come out. And so we're gonna see that played out. They hate this man. So Jesus is gonna get beaten all night, illegally tried, illegally arrested, illegally accused on trumped up charges with trumped up eyewitnesses, and it's gonna come from a man named Judas. Judas was from a place called Kerioth, or if Kerioth, Judas Iscariot. Judas was the only one of the disciples from South Israel, all the other disciples from North Israel. He was probably the most educated one. Like I said, he was the one who handled the money. If you saw Judas, you would think, that's a sharp person. Matter of fact, you know, I thought, why don't they let Matthew handle the money? He was like tax collector. That's what he does. He does money, right? Do you want an IRS guy handling your money? <laughs> so it wasn't Matthew. It was Judas. Another gospel writer tells us that Judas had been skimming money off the top. So he had already been disgruntled with where Jesus was leading him for a while. You see, I see this play out in ministry all the time. I love Jesus. I'm a Jesus follower. Got baptized, filled out a card, went to a camp, excited, loved the worship, loved hearing the word taught, and then I watch. They go to the press. And some, some rubbing starts happening in their life. Something doesn't go right. And then you watch people bail because God's not now performing the way God should perform. He's not doing what I signed up for. Does God have the right and the authority to do whatever he wants in your life, even if it's not what you would choose? He does it all the time. He does it through something called cancer. He does it oftentimes through a divorce. He does it through losing a job, financial struggles. He does it through stress. He does it through anxiety. He can do it through depression. He can do it through a myriad of things. Just have a kid. He'll do it, right? <laughs> How's he doing it in your life right now? You see, the pressing should cause you to cling more to him, not run from him. Isaiah 53 said, 500 years before this happened, that the shepherd will be killed and the sheep will scatter. John wants you to know Ladders, torches, weapons. John wants you to know that this is not happening because Jesus got outmaneuvered. He didn't get snuck up on. John wants you to know that this is happening exactly the way Jesus wanted it to happen. Matter of fact, Zechariah prophesied 500 years before that one will betray the Messiah for 30 pieces of silver. Isaiah 53 said, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, and Jesus is just being obedient, and he's running to the straight front line of the battle. Look with me at verse four. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, he's the one in charge, came forward and said to them, whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. Another gospel writer tells us that Judas let the guards know who Jesus was with a kiss. Ultimate betrayal, ultimate rejection, ultimate pain, ultimate hurt, and I want you to watch how Jesus responds to the Father instead of reacts to the sin of Judas. It says, whom do you seek? That's kind of a weird question, isn't it? Who are they going to arrest? Well, it's kind of a trick question. I think they were going to arrest all the disciples. And he's gonna ask them twice, whom do you seek, and make them say Jesus of Nazareth twice because he's making a point. I want you guys to say twice 
what your authorities told you to do and who your authorities told you to bring because they did not give you authority to arrest 12 guys a night. They gave you the, the command, the charge, the authority to arrest one, and I am he. Even when Jesus is about to face the worst night of his life, he's thinking about protecting his men. It says, whom do you seek? Jesus the Nazarene says, literally, I am him. Literally in the Greek, it says, I am. Back in your Old Testament when Moses was called by the Father to go to Egypt, Moses says, who will I send, who will I tell them sent me? And it's interesting because Moses was given the official holy name of God. Moses was told, when you go, you tell them Yahweh sent you. Yahweh sent you. We pronounce it Yahweh. Yahweh, it got translated in the Greek Septuagint to Jehovah. We put vowels in everything. There's no vowels in Hebrew. Yahweh, Jehovah. You tell them, there's three words, there's three Hebrew words in the word Jehovah. There's literally three words and it means, tell them I was, I am, and I will be sent you. Now can you imagine being Moses? Great. Who sent you? Who was and who is and who is to come sent me? Jehovah, the Lord, Yahweh has sent me. Jesus says the same thing right here. Who do you seek? Jesus the Nazarene, I am. I think Jesus has also given these men, and you'll see in the story, several opportunities to repent, even now. He's still evangelizing. Who, who would you come to get? Jesus of Nazarene. I was, I am, and I will be. I am. And what's amazing is they harden their hearts still. Now you're gonna see something real here, right here that's really interesting, and I'm gonna try to explain to you the best I can. Look at verse six. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. A lot of confusion when I read commentaries and other theologians, what they think's going on here. I think we overcomplicate Bible exegesis. I believe what happened here is exactly what verse six said happened. I believe he said, who do you come for? Jesus Nazarene. I was, I am, I will be, I am. I think they fall on their face. I think it's another opportunity for them to say, as the creator always before with the creature always before the creator, always falls on their face. I believe these men fell on their face. And I believe their hearts were still that hard. Remember I've said all the way through John, the issue is not lack of evidence, the issue is hardness of heart. Jesus once again is clearly telling them, I am, I am the Messiah. I am God in the flesh. I am the divine one. I am the Old Testament Jehovah, Yahweh. I am the incarnate Son of God, fully God, fully man. That's me. He's not pulling any punches. He is clearly evangelizing to the last moment, in my opinion. And here's what's amazing. I read one commentary. They said, why did they bring 600 men? If Jesus wanted to go to the cross, a little girl could have led him with her hand. If Jesus was not going to go to the cross, every army in the history of mankind could not have gotten him to the cross. John, once again, is letting you and I know that he is completely in charge and that when you are with Jesus, you are completely safe. Man did not kill Jesus. Jesus gave his own life up and the Father took it. This is not an anti-Semitic text. For generations, Jewish people have been accused of being the ones who killed the Messiah. Jewish men did not kill the Messiah. Gentile men did not kill the Messiah. God the Father killed the Messiah. Jesus the Son offered up his life willingly for you and for me. He didn't have to do it. Knowing some of you, I probably wouldn't have done it. <laughs> Knowing myself, I wouldn't have done it. How can we forever question the love of God in our life when we understand what he did?
Look at verse seven. It's real interesting. So he asked them again. They fall on their face. They get back up. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This is so Jesus. Like, they're about to take him away and just beat him to death, literally. And all he's thinking about is, I want to protect my men. So he has made them say twice now, we came for Jesus. We don't have the authority to take 12 guys a night. We have the authority to take one guy a night. And that's who we came for. And Jesus said, well, you need to understand who that guy is. That guy was and is and will be. That's the guy that you think you're arresting tonight. And the truth is, they weren't arresting Jesus. Jesus was arresting them. Jesus was grabbing their hearts with one last squeeze. And man still said, nope, let's kill him. Verse 10. And then Simon Peter, <laughs> good old Simon Peter. Actually, let's go back to seven. I skipped a couple verses there. So he asked them again, whom do you see? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. By the way, if you're in a bad season, a bad situation, you're the only Christian at work, you're the only Christian on the team, you're the only Christian in the sorority, you're the only Christian in the dorm, you're the only Christian fill in the blank, family dinner, God makes a majority. You know what I've noticed when I preach? I preach all alone. <laughs> There's, I come up here and those wimpy band guys, just, they just leave, right, when I walk up. <laughs> I mean, I, I've never seen the band move that fast when I walk up here. It's just me. You ever been to those churches growing up where they had the big stately chairs and there's, there's like a row of people sitting behind? That's weird to me too, but I'm just, <laughs> there's nobody up here. But God's here and God makes majority. You're never alone. You're never the minority. You are always the majority. You are always the one following the undefeated one. But Peter doesn't get that, so let's see what Peter wants to do. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Good old Peter, ready, fire, aim. <laughs> Historians tell us that Malchus became a believer. Isn't that interesting? I guess if you have an ear cut off and then someone heals it, you tend to believe. You know, during the day, you're like just kind of touching, oh gosh, yes, Jesus is real. <laughs> you know, when I was uh, working in camps and working with students and kids growing up, I used to tell this story. And I'd take my ear and I'd say, you know, Peter drew his sword out and he, he cut off Malchus's ear. <laughs> then Jesus touched it and he healed it. <laughs> These kids were like, <laughs> I got tricks. I don't know. <laughs> I remember at seminary, there's a guy in a seminary class asked professor, he said, So, was it a new ear or did he hear the old one? And I'll never forget what the seminary professor said. Oh, this is brilliant. He goes, Well, it was a healing of the old one. Of course, the guy's like, How do you know that? He said, Well, obviously, if it was a new ear, someone would have picked up the old ear and started a whole church movement out of that ear, <laughs> right? Because that's what we tend to do. We'd have a holy place and you come worship this ear and... <laughs> I digress. Look at verse 11. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father's given me? Peter, this is of the Father. This is not about Caiaphas or the Romans or the Pharisees or Judas. This is about me and what I'm doing and I'm in charge. A little encouragement here. If there's a cup given to you, by the way, Jeremiah talks about the wrath of God will be poured out upon the nations from a cup. The cup in the, in the Bible is a sign of the wrath of God being poured out. And that's exactly what Jesus said. It says, fathers, is any other way, let this cup pass from me. Jesus knew, I'm gonna die on the cross. Jesus knew this was the way. 
But he was also saying, God, this, this is not, this is not gonna be fun. I think the, the humanness of Jesus and his divinity at the moment, he was pouring his heart out to the Father because that's what you do when you have a cup. And I don't know what is in your cup right now, but I promise you if it comes from the hand of God, meaning you're a Jesus follower, then he's in charge of what's in the cup. He's in charge of the depth of the cup. He's in charge of the darkness in the cup and he will never take you where he will not provide his presence. God will never allow you to go to a depth that he's not still in charge. There's never a place you can go where you're out of his reach. And so it's interesting because this hill where Jesus is, another gospel writer tells us he was praying in such anguish this night he had drops of blood coming from his forehead. He tells his men more than one time, pray so you don't fall into temptation, Jesus goes further into the place, starts praying, comes out more than once and his men are all sleeping. See, a lot of times we wanna face the cup where we feel courageous to face the cup, but we haven't prayed. And when the cup actually gets poured out, we fold. Because prayer is where the power is. I heard someone say one time, well, man, I'm kinda, I was in a corner and back was against the wall, so I just cried out to God. Shouldn't we start there? That's not the last resort, that's the first step. It's interesting, this, this garden was also the same place, the same hill where 2,000 years earlier, Abraham had taken his only son to this hill. God has said, I want you to give your only son, your only begotten son. Abraham starts to kind of mess around with God. Isaac? Not Isaac, yeah, Isaac. Abraham's going up. If you ever read this as a father, it hurts your heart to read it. Going up to the son, the son is saying, well, who's gonna provide the sacrifice? God will provide the sacrifice, son. Straps in Isaac, raises up a knife, and the angel of Jehovah, the pre-incarnate Christ, says, stop. That's not the lamb today, he's not gonna die, and he provides a lamb in the thicket, same hill. Same hill where David, rejected as a king, sits on this hill and prays, says, take my life and, and, and keep the life of my fellow men. God says, no, I'm not gonna take your life. This time Jesus is praying and there's no word from the Father. You know, even though the Father didn't answer the Son what he was praying, he still answered the Son. You realize that, don't you? No answer from God is still answers from God. So we find out if you really wanna follow Jesus when the pressing starts. Biblically, when a covenant exists, it's not put into effect until the one who made the covenant dies. And this Jesus is about to die. Look at verse 12. So the band of soldiers and their captain, the officers of the Jews, arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Again, they're saying, we're gonna give you a trial and then we're gonna kill you. We'll talk about this in the next few weeks to come, but everything being done here was completely illegal. You see, in order, the Roman government had taken away the ability for the Jews to practice capital punishment. And the, and the Roman army was not going to kill a man because he claimed to be the son of God. They didn't care. The only thing that would bring capital punishment from a Roman government was the crime of sedition against the Roman government. And so these Jewish men had to figure out a way to get Jesus accused of sedition against the Roman government. They wanted to kill him as a false prophet, but Rome had to see him as a threat to Rome. That's why they took him to the people he took him to, which we'll look at in the weeks to come. That the crime is this man is against the Roman government. Look at verse 15. Simon Peter followed Jesus. Now I wish chapter 18 ends right there. Wouldn't that be great? Yay, Simon. The whole ear thing worked, right? Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. Who do you think that one is? Thomas. 
John. All through the book, John's going, the disciple Jesus loved, never names himself. So here's John. Some of the people followed Jesus, and so did another disciple, John. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, <laughs> he entered with Jesus in the court of the high priest. So Jesus goes into trial. John's the only disciple. Where's the other nine guys? <laughs> He'd eject. Gone. Ran. Took off. Nowhere to be found. John follows Jesus into the, into the trial. Look at verse 16. But Peter stood outside at the door. I find it ironic that Jesus had taught them that he was the door, and even now, Peter's outside the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. So there's, I don't know, 13, 14, 15-year-old girl who her job was to open the door and close the door when people came in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Jesus had just said twice, I am. Let these men go. Now Peter's saying, I am not. Look at the last verse. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. It's interesting that the man who would preach a few days after this at Pentecost and 3,000 people would come to faith was outside the door saying, I am not because he was scared what a 13-year-old doorkeeper would think. See, God can change anybody. If he changed you, that's proof. If he changed me, that's proof. For you to ever say, well, God can never get that guy. God can never change her heart. You don't know the power of God. And what changed this man from being scared of a little girl at the door to preaching and being crucified upside down was the resurrection. See, that changes everything. So it's interesting. I am, I am, I am not. When Jesus is in the heat of his trial, Peter is out by the fire warming up. While Peter is denying Jesus, Jesus is protecting Peter. So I'm gonna spend just the next few minutes applying this force because I believe in an iPhone world injustice is inevitable in your life. You're gonna be misunderstood. You're gonna be gossiped about. You're gonna be slandered. You're gonna be at times maligned. People will say things about you that is not true. Sometimes they'll say things about you that are true and it doesn't feel any better just because it's true. In a iPhone world, people are not gonna like you. I recently had a situation where someone was maligning my character. And I went through the normal emotions we all go through because I'm human just like you. I was hurt, then I was angry. And then I thought, what do I do? I called one of my mentors and he looked at me and said, what would Jesus do? I don't like this mentor. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was preparing this text this week. I was like, I'm gonna do exactly what Jesus did. I'm gonna do nothing except what God tells me to do. I'm not telling you that because you think I'm some kind of super spiritual person. I'm telling you that, that we have the perfect example that when someone hurts you and someone maligns you and someone talks about you and someone spreads rumors and someone is mean and ugly to you, we have an example in Jesus because all through this trial, everything's illegal and he never speaks a word that's not sincere. He answers every question with dignity of truth. He never reacts to the people that are hurting him and he only protects those he loves and he always does it with a holy righteousness. You see, God will defend me so I don't have to. You see, you're either gonna have a cup or you're gonna have a sword. And when I have a sword... I mess things up. And when I have a sword, I've learned I can't drink from the cup and use the sword at the same time. I gotta put the sword down. And I've gotta trust him. I say along with Paul, if I were still trying to please man, I would no longer be a bondservant of Christ Jesus. People ask me sometimes, why do other churches or a lot of churches not preach the word 
because it's not popular to preach the word. It's popular to make everyone just feel great. And I want you to feel good, some. But I want you to be convicted. I want you to change. I want you to be better. And when people speak against you this week, I want you to be kind back to them. When people malign your character, I don't want you to speak about theirs. And when someone has betrayed you and hurt you, you have a prime example of how you continue to be godly. You can't say, Pastor, it's too hard. Jesus did it, and he empowers you to do it. So you're either gonna be following them or him. That's what this text says to me. You're following them or you're following him. I'll go with the undefeated one. I've read the end of the book. I know who wins. This is as bad as it gets for us. And if you get maligned or if you get accused or if you get gossiped about, it's true or it's not. If it's not true, you confess sin and you make sure your heart is clean and you just trust God to defend his word. If you need to confess sin and some of it is true, deal with it with the spirit of God in your life. But the object of response is never a human. The object of response is the Lord God himself. And he wields a sword and he will come one day with sword drawn. Bible says there's a white horse in heaven just waiting for him to mount. So I don't have to fight battles. All I've got to do is be faithful, amen? So what happens, even we saw that story today about divorce, and again, I know divorce is a horrible thing. In the church, people get divorced and they want the church to take sides. We're not gonna take sides. We're gonna try to reach both people with truth. I don't care who's right or wrong. What I care about is not blaspheming the testimony of the gospel that we would do this well. And if you're the victim and you're the one that's been hurt, you have probably hurt someone else in your life as well at some point. And God has forgiven you and you have to forgive. Be godly. We know who wins. So in a garden, first garden of the Bible, the Garden of Eden, a man sins, gets kicked out of the garden. Second garden of the Bible, a man is fully submissive, obeys, and is a blessing to the world. There's a third garden in your Bible, Revelation 21 and 22, it's called the heavenly city, and there'll be no more death, and there'll be no more sin, and there'll be no more, you know what the Bible says? This is awesome, night. For the light of the presence of God will light that place. No one goes clubbing at 3 p.m., do they? You go out at midnight. And what a good, Bible-believing, Jesus-clinging person can do is you pull your covers up at night, sleeping under your father's roof, and you sleep very well because you've read the end of the book. And we can forgive, and we can do this well. I'll close with this because I think Judas is also a great example for us. Judas is someone who had great proximity with Jesus, but he had no intimacy with Jesus, which is possible. You can come to church, you can serve, you can give, you can be in a small group, you can pray, you can read your Bible and have no intimacy in your heart toward the Lord whatsoever. Because you're more worried about what people think than the reality of the inside. That's Judas. That's the spirit of Judas. I was reminded this week of what John Bunyan wrote in The Pilgrim's Progress, his closing words. He wrote this, and it's it's haunting. I'll read this to close. Then I saw that there was a way to hell, even from the gates of heaven, so near and yet so far. One day Jesus will come back and he will draw his sword, and my plea to you is that you be friends with him now instead of an enemy because you will not win. He is undefeated. He is God. And the natural response of us is to fall on our face before him. We are either with them or him. And by the way, them's not the enemy. Because we were them. Now we're with him. 
and we have over abundant love for them because our heart breaks, amen? Father, we are grateful for an example of Jesus that's so cross-cultural, anti-cultural of everything we see in our culture today where people just go after each other. And Lord, whether it's done out of insecurity or hatred or fear, that people just attack. And Lord, I'm so grateful to be here with my friends today praying to you that we now see what it means to love the unlovable, to be kind to the unkind, and to cling closely to you. Father, I am so grateful that we're never alone and you are the great defender. And Lord, we look forward to being in the house you prepared for us forever where there's no more night. And until that day comes, may we be a very winsome, loving, kind people. It's in your name we pray, amen.